Today is a big topic. It's about recruitment and it's being hosted by our very own John Bethel. Uh, recruitment is really huge. Um, assembling your team, especially at scale up, is a really important topic and it's a very much a break point for a lot of startups. Uh, indeed, here at EIT Health, one of our major evaluation criteria is the team management capabilities. So it's really fitting for us to invite uh, John Bethel here, who is a, a mentor on our mentoring and coaching network here at EIT Health. He will be talking you through how to assemble a team when you're scaling and how to do it effectively on a startup budget. So um, it's a pleasure to have you, John. Uh, just a little background on John. He is a medical doctor by training who is a pioneer of medical recruitment. He um, changed the game in Australasia before joining us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Since joining us here, he's built on his 20 years of experience um, scaling these large award-winning companies. And he's recently formed um, Luca Global Group. And um, he works with startup founders to help them build their in-house recruitment processes, which he will talk to us a bit more about today. So uh, John, without further ado, uh, please take it away. I'm going to make you host now. So thank you very much, Anna. That was, uh... Kind of introduction, you, uh, you saved me uh, some of the, uh, hang on, it says, do you want to continue? Yes, here we go. So I'm going to just fire up my uh, presentation here and play. So yes, uh, welcome everyone to this um, uh, recruitment module. I, I call it Recruitment 101 for Startups. And I, and I guess the, um, the essence of this uh, presentation is to be, uh, entirely practical and uh, implementable, so executionable, um, so that you can hopefully go away after 40 minutes to 50 minutes with a, a basic uh, framework for, for um, improving and or setting up your, uh, your own recruitment strategy. And I've uh, specifically made reference here to the, uh, the startup budget factor. The, uh, the point is that um, most of this is about your skills, uh, but I'll also talk about um, some fairly, uh, uh, some very cost effective tools that you can use to really improve uh, the process as you, as you go. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a fairly um, uh, sort of obvious statement, which is around the, uh, the pillars of success of a startup. So obviously when you're starting a new business, uh, it's going to be built around a concept, so an idea, a service, uh, whatever it is you're uh, innovating or inventing. And that will be the, uh, the subject matter of your, of your product. Um, of course, I don't need to remind any of you that you're going to need um, money along the way. And that uh, is uh, a constant uh, process of, um, of uh, you know, search for, for you as you grow your business, particularly as you scale it. Uh, and there's uh, no more um, uh, sort of a money hungry sector than life sciences. So that's always going to be a big factor in, in your business growth. But of course, the final part is the people. Uh, and that's uh, including yourself, it includes the uh, co-founders co that you start the business with. Uh, and then as you grow, it's uh, about the people that you bring into the business because they're going to make uh, a huge difference uh, to the uh, success of your organization. And um, I, I would also sort of make the point that um, the, the people and the money are quite closely linked in the sense that when you're talking to um, uh, venture capital and investors, they're always going to be looking very closely at the people that you have. So, so getting that part uh, right is, is really, really important. Uh, so I'm going to, before we go into the basics of recruitment, I'm going to talk about the concept of employment brand, which you may or may not be familiar with. You may or may not have given some thought for your own business. Um, but if we look at the pillars of employment brand, so uh, this is about, you know, why would someone work for you, essentially? So initially, uh, the thing that they're going to be interested in working on is, is your product again. So it's the same issue. Um, you know, is this going to be a, an exciting project? Is it going to be impactful? Um, you know, is it going to be something that's interesting to work on? Do, do they believe in it? Um, of course, uh, people come to work uh, and uh, are generally looking for some sort of purpose. Why are we doing this? Uh, where is this going to go? Um, you know, what are the sort of values that uh, this, this product uh, espouses and how does it fit my own personal values? And uh, finally, people are really interested in knowing who they're going to work with. Um, you know, what is, uh, who are the leadership in the company? What are the values, uh, the mission of the, of the organization? What are the objectives? 
Uh, and then who are my colleagues? Who are the people that I'm going to work alongside? So, so that's another really critical factor. And we'll come back to the concept of employment brand as we go along. So I've uh, you know, put up this slide to basically say there's a bit of preparation you need to, to do in order to be uh, ready and effective at recruiting. So I'm going to talk about uh, this point first. So if you're a small team, well, if you're a, if you're a, um, a solo entrepreneur, then it's quite clear that you delegate to yourself. But if you're a team, uh, I would highly recommend that you allocate someone who is not responsible for all recruitment, but someone who's responsible for the process of recruitment. In the same way as a small team, you probably identify someone who's probably going to take the lead on science, someone who's going to take the lead on uh, you know, finance and, and billing and invoicing and accounting, uh, someone who may be more on the business development side of things. It's worth uh, allocating this uh, responsibility of one person within your organization. And uh, they're going to effectively, uh, and I, you know, I put here, so I'm going to put the next two up here. Um, I put software first because I'm going to come to that in a later slide. Uh, in, in my opinion, there's really very few excuses for not using some of the proprietary systems out there. Um, and the reason I put process after that is because every software that's uh, uh, based on recruitment is going to have its own process built into it. And uh, part of your selection process, if you're looking at software, is to, is to trial it and test it out and then decide which process makes the most sense to you. Um, plus most systems are pretty customizable. So you can then uh, define, well, what steps do we actually want in our recruitment process? So I've got a question here. I'm going to chuck up a poll um, question and let me have a look. So if you guys can um, uh, give me a sense of uh, how you currently do your recruitment if you're doing it. Um, so we basically saying when you're recruiting, what, uh, where do you mostly store and process your resumes? And so there's a number of options here. You know, a lot of people use their, their email and just keep it in their inbox. A lot of people use some sort of a document folders. Some people go with spreadsheets, their table, things like that. Um, and there are some people that use recruitment software already and some people have not done any recruitment. So I suppose other would come under that. Um, so we're up to 48% of the votes. So I'm seeing fairly straight away that um, people are using document folders. So that's probably on Google Docs or somewhere on a, on a Microsoft um, uh, Office server. Quite a lot of people are relying on their emails. Um, so four out of the 19 are already recruiting software, which is, uh, which is good. I'd be kind of interested to know if anyone's um, uh, using the ones that I'm about to, uh, to present to you. So we're up to 19. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll end the poll there. And I'm just gonna sort of share it. So you can see that most people are using something like a Google Drive uh, for documents, I'm assuming, uh, but whatever folder system. Um, so an equal measure spreadsheets and existing recruitment software. Uh, and some people are just relying on capturing um, uh, emails and uh, with resumes in them in, in their uh, email folders, which is, you know, I, I, I must confess, you know, that's something I did many, many years ago. But, um, you know, with many years in recruitment now, I've, uh, I've come to understand that uh, properly configured recruitment software is really, really critical. Um, so, uh, and, you know, some people are, and I, like I said, I'd like to, if any of you guys using recruitment software can share in the Q&A which ones you're using, that'd be kind of interesting. So. I'm going to shop, stop sharing for now and we're going to move on to the next. Uh, so let me just talk about software uh, and why it's actually going to improve your recruitment uh, activities. So first of all, um, it need not be expensive. If you're using uh, Slack or you're using, using Asana or, uh, you know, any of these sort of intranet tools or, uh, you know, tools for posting to, to your social media, there's plenty of recruitment software options that are similarly priced. You know, they're on a, on a, a monthly cost or a per a recruitment cost, uh, but they're really designed for small businesses. And um, there are, of course, incredibly large and expensive systems, but you don't need to be looking at those. Uh, and I'm going to name a few in a minute. Um, they really drive methodology. Just remember the recruitment is a project and it has a, you know, has a beginning and an end and it has a set of steps along the way. And um, recruitment software will really help to, uh, not only enforce that methodology, but it'll teach you how to recruit on the way just by dint of uh, going through the process. 
Um, most recruitment software integrates with job boards and social media, so you don't have to post those things separately to multiple different places. You basically write your ad copy once and you post with one click of a button. So it greatly improves your, uh, uh, the extent of your, uh, uh, your reach when it comes to uh, posting that job out to all your various outlets. Um, recruitment software is very good at helping you to uh, corral candidates at certain stages in the process, uh, allows you to screen and rank candidates all in all against each other. And then that's uh, that really sort of makes sense. You know, when you've got multiple uh, applications for the same job, uh, it can be a bit confusing, particularly if they're all stuffed in your emails or they're just uh, stuck in, um, in a folder somewhere. Um, this kind of lines them all up against each other and you can, uh, you can rank them all against each other. So it quickly helps you get through that sort of funnel process. And um, finally, it helps you build a talent pool. So all those people that apply to your first job, uh, you'll probably hire one um, if you're lucky. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there may be multiple other people who applied that you, uh, you were not interested in or you rejected. But in a year's, year's time, they may actually be useful for you. So uh, you can come back to them. And uh, uh, if they're already in your database, then you can actually do some search and find people. So I've, I've certainly done that with my own internal recruitment. And that's definitely how recruitment agencies work. You know, we, uh, we basically uh, uh, keep, keep tabs on people that we've contacted before. And, uh, and we often will in, interact with someone now and, and not place them for a year. But, uh, you know, if you, if you don't keep track of them, uh, then you lose them. And that, that uh, is, is a real shame. So I've, I've put this up. This is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic as to which recruitment software you use, but I've done quite a lot of searching of, um, of lists of software packages for, uh, uh, for startups. And uh, these are the ones that seem to come up uh, time and time again. Uh, I've had a close look at Workable, which I really like. I've, uh, I've used Zoho Recruit in the past, um, and it's certainly functional. It's cheap and uh, comes with a lot of uh, features. Um, I noticed that, uh, I haven't looked at it, but I know Google have a, a product. So if any of you are on the Google suite, uh, that could be a very quick and easy um, uh, option for you to, to dive into. It may, it may or may not cost you any more. Um, this is the kind of, and I was just gonna say that I'm, I'm going to um, share this, uh, this uh, presentation as a PDF um, with Ala at the end of it. So she can uh, distribute it to anyone that's uh, attended and wants to, um, uh, keep a list of this um, or you can take screenshots as you go um, so um, but anyway these are these are all amongst the most popular systems that are out there obviously look at a few and work out which one is best for you from a cost and from a functionality perspective um, but there, there are some there are plenty of options and yeah it'd be interesting to know if any of you guys that uh, any of the four of you that are already using recruitment software are using any of these or if you have any other suggestions so let's say you've got your founder team together and you're, uh, you know, you've got your business up and running and you're, um, uh, you're now thinking that it's time to sort of hire. So a really important question to ask yourself is, you know, when is the right time to start bringing people onto your business? Um, so there's a few sort of rules of thumb here. Um, the first one is when you're doing something that's just not a good use of your time, if you find yourself getting really bogged down with, um, with admin when you should be out networking or working on clinical trials or working on the science or whatever it happens to be, um, that's usually a good indication that you probably want to start to outsource that. Um, when you actually need new skills in your business, so you look around your team and you say, right, well, you know, we, we complementarily have all these skills, but in fact, we need something new in the business and we need to go out and hire that. It's actually can be a much uh, better way of doing things than trying to uh, learn those skills yourself. Uh, naturally, when you need to grow, and uh, often an inflection point for uh, startups is when you've raised some money uh, and there's a bit of pressure to actually scale up your business and, uh, and expand it. And uh, clearly, you're going to need some more people at that point. Um, so, uh, so that's another trigger. And, uh, you know, I, I put this in here because hiring people is, is not a decision to be made you know, lightly. I mean, you actually need to look at uh, how much are you going to pay this person, but there are all sorts of other hidden costs. There's the, uh, you know, the sort of operational costs of having them uh, in an office. They may need a desk, a computer, or some other tools that are going to make them functional in their role. Um, you've got to look at the entire cost of, of their employment. And then there's other costs along the lines of your 
uh, you know, your personal time in terms of looking for them, your time in terms of uh, managing and mentoring them, coaching them. Um, these, are, these are all significant costs. And I guess another uh, critical decision to make is, you know, do we hire someone and bring them on full time or do we, uh, do we contract in those skills? And, and I would say when, you know, if you're inexperienced at recruiting and uh, it's a, a fairly um, new part of what you do and you're a small business, I would strongly say that it, it's advisable to try and put off the process of hiring someone uh, on the permanent payroll as long as possible. Contractors can look more expensive in the short term. But uh, in the long term, uh, you know, you can turn them on and off. If it's not working out, you can get rid of them without too much pain. You also learn a lot by putting someone as a contractor in that role first, and then that actually teaches you what it is you're looking for in the permanent role. So, uh, so yeah, as a small business, there's a lot of inherent risk with, uh, with actually taking people on. Um, so this, is, this would be a good one to screenshot if you're gonna do it, because it's kind of like the overall map of the stages of recruitment. And, um, uh, effectively, any recruitment software would have uh, um, a version of this baked into its uh, into its functions in terms of the process. But uh, I break it into sort of five basic steps. There's the planning phase, the promotion phase, uh, the selection phase, uh, verification, and then negotiation. So planning is about putting together your job description, um, populating your database with the right information about the role. Uh, and then of course, writing the ad copy to uh, present to the world. Um, promotion is when you push it out there and, uh, and that's usually through advertising. It may well be through uh, networking locally or through LinkedIn, um, a very uh, sort of potent way of, uh, of going out and looking for the right sort of people. And then of course, social media is, uh, is hard to avoid these days as, a, as an outlet and does work um, increasingly so. Um, then the next stage is selection, which means uh, screening candidates, uh, deciding which ones move forward and which ones fall by the wayside. Uh, shortlisting, which is a process of deciding who you're going to actually interview. Uh, then you push that forward to the interview process. Uh, and obviously at the end of that, you'll hopefully uh, have your uh, favorite uh, one or two candidates. Uh, verification, uh, I'll come back to reference checking later, but there's other things you can do that, that uh, might be worth considering. You might want to do psychometric testing um, or some kind of credentialing if, uh, if the role is, uh, is sensitive and may require um, you know, a police check, for example, or you may need to check some qualifications. These are things that are often overlooked and forgotten about uh, and can, can have some dire consequences if you get that wrong. And then, of course, finally, there's the negotiation phase, um, which involves making an offer, negotiating, and then hiring. And we're going to go through these sort of as individual slides now. So I'm going to move on to what I consider to be. And I just uh, actually posted a blog this week uh, on this very subject. And, I, and I've, uh, on my blog site, which is on our website, I've, I've put a, a template which you can cut and paste and download and use. Um, but the job specification really is the the sort of most important starting phase. And it's often missed. I mean, I ask people, what's the first thing you do when you start hiring? They say, well, we write an ad. Well, if you're writing an ad, then there's no real planning around that. And uh, if you get the ad wrong, you're gonna attract the wrong kind of people. So much better to start with a proper project plan, which in this case is the, the job spec. Um, and you'll use this to then write the ad because uh, once you've clearly delineated what it is you need uh, in this role, um, writing the ad becomes much easier, much quicker, um, because it, it clearly just sort of, you basically take the same information, you condense it down, and then you, uh, you give a bit of a, an external spin to it, and, uh, and then you've got your ad. Um, and your ad is consistent with your job specification, so hopefully you're attracting the right people. You'll use it through the screening process, because you'll be benchmarking candidates' resumes against your job specification, and the list of things that you said were going to be important. Um, you use it to derive your interview questions, um, your reference checks, uh, and even beyond that, even beyond the point where you've hired someone, you'll use it to determine you know, how you need to onboard someone um, and, and subsequently how you need to manage them. You know, what uh, sort of performance metrics are you going to put this person on? It all comes and starts with the job specification. So get that right and everything else flows much more, uh, more freely. So it might seem like a lot of work up front, but I, I do promise you it's worth it. Um, and finally, and this is not a small issue, I mean, I speak to a lot of um, founder, founder teams about their recruitment uh, experiences and, um, you know, their sort of worst nightmare is hiring someone that, that isn't right and uh, then really struggling with the process of trying to uh, 
uh, you know, bring themselves around to letting them go. And uh, if you've had a very clear job description, you've uh, recruited well, then you should have a lot less of this. But if you do have that situation and you have a, a management process that's uh, very clear about what this person's objectives are, then it makes it much easier to sit down and have a mature conversation with them about what they're delivering and what the expectations of the job were. And uh, you know, have a have a sort of an amicable parting of the ways, as opposed to the sort of um, emotional disaster area that I hear people tell me about all the time. Um, so you know, bear, bear all of those things in mind when you're um, when you're sitting down to write your job description. Um, this is a, a sort of a really summarised version of what I put in my uh, my blog. Um, but basically, there are some headings that you can use which give you uh, some guidance as to what you need to put in your job spec. So the objective is really a high level, you know, one short paragraph saying, you know, what, why are we hiring this person? What do we expect them to do? Reporting lines, obviously, you know, who, who do they report to? Uh, the relationships can be internal or external. So if it's uh, internal, um, you know, who are their colleagues? Uh, who do they manage if, if necessary? External or um, you know, who are the uh, stakeholders that they have to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the tasks are the actual activities that they need to engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. So you need a, a, a range of bullet points around that. Um, skills, experience, and attributes. So skills are obviously the, um, uh, you know, the sort of uh, skills that people have picked up in previous roles that they can transfer over to this role. Um, and those are often transferable across industries. Experience less so. Uh, obviously, if you really need someone who's worked in a particular area of science, then uh, uh, obviously uh, you need to sort of look for that. But um, uh, certainly in my experience, um, attributes are, are, are the sort of qualities of the person that are that you know don't really change a huge amount over time. I mean, you know, they either have them or they don't. And this is about their work ethic, their their value system. Um, it's about how they deal with uh, you know setbacks. Um, uh, you know how they interact with the other team members. You know their interpersonal skills. These are these are qualities that may um, uh, uh, may seem less important than the experience in the first instance. And uh, certainly, someone who has less experience but stronger attributes may start behind uh, the equivalent with uh, those two the other way around but in the long term I, i've always find that the people with uh, strong attributes um, and certainly smart people with strong attributes who are willing to learn uh, overtake uh, people who just have experience but are you know on the 50th centile in terms of capability and then finally you want to sort of uh, clearly state what the conditions of this role are going to be you know that's that's where you de determine um, uh, you know, what your budget is going to be for this person and, uh, you know, how you're going to pay for it and uh, what sort of work expectations you need of them in terms of hours, etc. So I'm just going to go through a quick uh, set of um, uh, headlines for how to write ad copy. So let's assume you've got your job spec specification um, uh, clearly laid out uh, and that's going to be the sort of uh, the framework of your ad. Um, uh, you know, I sort of say it's really important, you know, bear in mind that your ad copy is not just advertising this role, it's advertising your whole organization. And for many, for many small companies, this is the first time you've gone out to market to talk about who you are and what you stand for. So, you know, start off right at the, the, the header of the ad by talking about who you are and convey that pride and passion in what you're doing, particularly as a startup, because, um, you know, at this point, you've got no reputation in the marketplace. You need to start building that. That's that's your not only your employment brand, but your overall brand as well. Um, so, you know, I've got a few sort of tricks here. First of all, paragraph one should describe yourself. Um, so it's basically a good way of putting it is our company, something along the lines of this, right? Our company is, and then describe who you are, what you do, what you stand for, etc. And um, the next thing would be to have a paragraph that describes the actual role itself. So. Uh, and I, the way I phrase this is you will be working as, um, so you, you can have a variant of this if you want, but th there's nothing more dull than an ad that starts and says the, the successful person in this role will be, you know, it doesn't really put that person in the position uh, and doesn't give them a sense of, um, you know, sort of uh, ownership of that role. Whereas if you describe it this way, you will be working as people start to say, oh yes, I will be doing that. So um, that's, that's sort of a nice way to phrase things. Um, Similarly, uh, describe them. Um, so give them a sense of the, the profile that you're looking for. So, you know, I, I like to start it with, you are a you know, uh, 
whatever whatever statements you need, you know. So uh, uh, an ambitious young scientist with such and such a background and these kind of skills and qualities. And people will look at that and they say, yeah, yeah, that, that's me, you know, uh, I fit that criteria. And again, if you say, uh, in order to fulfill this role, this person needs to be, it's just much more boring and takes up far too many words. Remember with ad copy, um, less is more. The, the less you write, the less you can get away with writing, the more likely people are to read it all the way to the bottom. And that's really critical. And, uh, you know, I, um, you know, I come from a, an era where ad, ads were all in, in the papers and you literally had no choice. You had to squeeze it into a small, um, you know, sort of 10 by three centimeter box. Uh, whereas now every, every ad page can be, you know, sort of war and peace. And uh, unfortunately, people aren't going to read it. Um, so again, in the discipline of writing punchy ad copy, it should be a lot shorter than your job description, for example. Um, sell the role. So this is the sort of um, uh, uh, the last thing, you know, one of the last things you want the person to actually see is like, you know, this is a great role because, and then point out the benefits, the opportunities, the uh, chance to work with a great company, et cetera, um, the promotional opportunities, whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, that's, that's a nice sort of lead on to, you know, the call, of, call to action, which is basically, you know, give them an indication of how they need to apply. Now, if you have recruitment software, you will have a, a URL link, which goes straight to an application form, which is embedded in your software. And um, that will, funnel all your candidates um, through exactly the same process and into a software package that you can then capture them in. Um, and believe me, that'll save you a lot more time than using folders and cutting and pasting, et cetera. Um, and people, uh, you know, they will talk about screening questions later, but people will surrender quite a bit more information in a standardized format if you use a good application form. Uh, this is really key. I mean, if you're, if you're running an ad, um, I mean, I, I'm, I will typically, it doesn't matter whether it's a CEO or a junior role, I'll typically give two weeks for this ad to run. You know, I push it out everywhere I can think of right up front and I give it two weeks. And I state that uh, because, um, you know, if people aren't given an end date, then they don't really know when to apply. They don't know when it closes. They might sort of come back to it and you've taken it down. Um, a couple of basic um, truisms about recruitment is uh, the best candidates rarely are the first ones to apply. Quite often the people that apply first are you know, professional job app appliers. They've, they've been on the market for a long time. They're just cutting and pasting their CV and, and their cover letter and firing it off to any job that they can think about. Um, smart, you know, well-organized candidates who are um, you know, already in a good job but looking for a next step uh, usually don't have the time to rush out an, uh, an application straight away. But if, they're, if they have good time management skills, they'll look at the end date, they'll put it in their diary, and then they'll spend the weekend writing the perfect uh, you know, cover letter that really addresses the criteria, um, tidying up their CV, and then they'll apply in the last two or three days. Um, so setting an end date is, is really important, don't forget it. Um, let's just talk about putting together a short list. So coming back to that issue of the, the best candidates are not always the first to apply. Um, you know, when people start to roll in, don't immediately start to engage in a significant way with uh, the first few candidates that come in because, um, you know, you, you really want to see the whole field before you, you sit back and look at them. And this, of course, can be, you know, can be a huge time waste of getting all excited about the, the people that apply on day one and then find that the people who don't apply on day five are much better. Um, you put a lot of effort into those first candidates. Um, the one thing you do owe them is some sort of an acknowledgement, whether it be an automatic one or whether you write a, um, a template that you then send out once you've seen the candidates. But you do need to acknowledge with people that, yes, I've seen your resume. I see you've applied. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we will be getting back to people uh, after the closing date. And then, then they know where they stand. And that's really, really important. And we'll talk about follow-up and rejection later. Um, uh, I would say, you know, if people are clearly inappropriate, you know, have a standard, polite, helpful uh, template email in your system that, um, that uh, rejects people and just says, you know, thank you for your application, but unfortunately you don't meet our criteria. We wish you all the best, you know, uh, uh, whatever, whatever it says, but, you know, keep it polite, but let them move on, all right? And get them off your system because, you know, you're, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna be wanting to focus on the people that are most important to you. Um, so he, most recruitment systems will have a pre-screen function in, their, uh, in, the, in the software. And our pre-screen 
can be very useful, particularly for low level jobs that have lots and lots of applications. And they're basically, you know, you don't want to go to town on this because people don't want to fill in an endless pre screen. But if there are key criteria like you must have a PhD to do this role, then, you know, ask the question do you have a PhD? Uh, and if they don't, it saves you an awful lot of time and effort scrolling through their resume trying to, you know, guess whether they do or don't or they're calling it something else or, or, or what have you. You know, other things like, do you have a work permit to, to work in, you know, Europe or my country? Uh, if they don't and you're not intended to sponsor someone, then that can, you know, quickly. And it, it also sets up an expectation of the candidate that, oh, right, now that I've read this question, I can see that I don't actually fulfill the criteria. And it just softens the blow when you reject them. Um, but, uh, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't do a whole interview process in the pre-screen that can be, uh, you know, they should really be yes or no questions. Um, uh, I would say create a long list. Uh, this is certainly my process. You know, when I uh, have uh, a bunch of applicants, I, I may have, you know, 15 to 20 people, sometimes even 25 people who I think, you know, could potentially do the job, but I can't really tell from the resume. There's a few that you might think I absolutely have to speak to that person, but the majority of them, you know, will be, a little bit of a mystery until you've had some kind of uh, direct contact. Now, uh, the one thing you don't want to do is call every single one of them in for a one hour interview. Uh, you know, I had a, I gave this lecture to a, a founder in Switzerland who has a business with about 20 people. And he told me, he says, I've interviewed 50 people and I, you know, face to face, and I've only hired two of them. And I said, well, you, you know, you've wasted yourself an awful lot of time. You've raised a lot of expectations. Uh, you know, and there's been a lot of disappointment all around. Uh, you could have, you could have culled this out with a five minute phone screen with, with all of those candidates first. And I bet within one or two minutes, you know, probably within 60 seconds, you know whether they're gonna be suitable for the role or not. You know whether you're gonna click with them, you know whether they've got the sort of energy or dynamism, uh, a personality fit, you know, if they're articulate about what it is they do. You know, trust your judgment on that. You, you're amazed, it'd be amazed, you'd be amazed how much you can get through in a, in a five minute phone call conversation. And you then really haven't wasted your time. And even today, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly being surprised by people that don't look great. And then I speak to them and I think they're fantastic. And similarly, uh, people that, uh, you know, look amazing on paper. And then I talk to them, it's quite clear they're not going to be right for the role uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so I, I strongly suggest you use that five minute phone conversation uh, method. Um, you want to build a short list. Uh, you know, two is kind of too few. You've only got two people to compare. Um, Six is probably too many. It's getting a little confused and you haven't done enough uh, screening of the long list process. Somewhere between three and four candidates to interview uh, in quick succession is probably the best because then you really get to benchmark uh, some people against each other and really get a sense of who's best. And we'll talk about interviewing in the moment. And uh, I would say once you've gone through that long list phase, don't hang around, reject the ones that you know for a fact are not going to move forward. Again, it keeps your list clear. It get, you know, allows those people to move on. Um, nobody likes to be rejected, but they, I can assure they much prefer to be rejected than just sort of left hanging. Uh, uh, I promise you, nobody likes that. Uh, I'm just gonna, there's a question in the q and I'm just gonna jump in there. So, all right, okay, thanks. That's uh, not really a question, sort of a pitch, but uh, I'll come back to that at a later stage. Um, so let's talk about uh, the interview process. Um, so, uh, it, to my advice, I, it depends on your resources, obviously, but uh, by my experience, having two people interviewing face-to-face uh, -face with a candidate is far more effective than having just one person one-on-one. -on -one. Um, first of all, uh, when you're talking, you're just not listening as much. And uh, quite often you'll find that the person that's uh, uh, asking the questions and making the eye contact and engaging with the candidate is not really taking in everything that's been said. They're, they're responding to all sorts of other cues. The other person uh, sitting to the side is, is gonna pick up on a lot of um, nuances in the question. We'll be able to write down the answers um, and uh, keep a record of that. Um, uh, with my uh, business partner in Australia, we always, uh, we always interviewed both of us and uh, we would alternate questions. So we would uh, we'd draw up a list of questions and, we, and I'd get one set and she'd get the alternate ones. Um, so we were, we were always responsible for the same question. That kept the process consistent that meant every candidate was getting exactly the same recruitment process. And that's a, a really potent way to, to uh, allow you to uh, determine which candidates are, are floating to the top and which ones are falling by the wayside. 
Um, so I've made this point, ask everybody the same question. Um, really important to do that. It, you know, sort of free ranging interviews can, can give you a very false impression of, of candidates. So if you've got a candidate who's very articulate and um, you know, really engaging, and another one who's a bit shy and self-effacing, um, if, if you're not sort of asking them exactly the same questions, then the, the direction of the interview will go off on completely different tangents. And you really won't be able to compare one with the other. And you might you know, get a gut feeling that the first one was uh, gonna be more fun to work with, but you're gonna miss out potentially on a really uh, strong candidate because you haven't asked the right questions. So make sure you do ask the questions. I'm gonna talk about what uh, we in the industry call competency-based questions. So a competency-based question is a question specifically phrased to look for past behaviors uh, around a particular skill. And remember your job description, you're, you're building these competency-based questions around the, um, uh, the tasks and attributes and even the experience and even the values fit um, that are important to you. Um, so in terms of looking for past behaviors, if you start every question with some, you know, some wording along the lines of, can you give me an example of a time when you, uh, now it might be, let's say you ask the question, uh, you know, how, what's your management style? You know, this is, you're not gonna get a real answer from that person. You're, what you're gonna get is a bunch of cliches, probably a list that they've read from a book uh, or they've seen on a website. But if you ask someone, can you describe a time where you had to performance management someone who was, uh, who was underperforming, how did you go about uh, you know, approaching it, um, you know, what was the process and what was the outcome? Um, much harder for the candidate to make that up if they haven't done it. Um, it's also very likely they're going to give you a true representation of what happened and that will give you strong clues as to uh, how they performed in that role. Um, and look, their response may, be, uh, may not be right or wrong, but it may be right for you. Uh, and your organization. So, you know, you know how you manage people in, uh, you know, a sort of a, a life sciences startup might be totally different from how you performance manage people in the army, for example. So, you know, this is about you and your organization and what, what makes sense for you. Um, I, I do recommend asking around values fit. If, if there's not a values, I mean, if you've determined what your values are in your business and all your founders are aligned with that and you start to bring people into the company who have different values, you're quickly gonna have problems with that. Um, so it, you know, it is possible to ask, so you think of a value and then you think of a behavior that might have demonstrated or a scenario that may have, um, uh, elicited those values. So for example, you can ask someone, uh, you know, can you, can you, um, describe a time where you, you felt, uh, um, you know, the, the company you were working for was acting unethically or, uh, in a way that was not uh, appropriate for your values. How did, you, how did it make you feel? What did you do about it? Uh, what was the outcome? So that's, that's a, a really important sort of, uh, you know, set of questions to include in your questionnaire. Um, you know, make sure you understand what this person is earning, what their expectations are, and also what their timings are. Uh, it's also really useful to know if they're looking at other opportunities. Um, they may or may not tell you any of these things, but uh, it's important to ask them. Um, and it's quite, you know, it's quite informative if people are a bit guarded at this point, uh, you know, that, that may sort of uh, say something about uh, how upfront and honest they're being with you anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, particularly if you've got a candidate you really like, uh, it's, it's good to know that they're, you know, they're absolutely ready to move in the next couple of weeks and they've got two other offers. You know, you may want to sort of step up your activities in terms of keeping that person warm. You don't want to lose them. No surprises. And then always ask questions at the end of the interview. So, um, uh, you know, always leave about 10 minutes. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, candidates who have no questions, oh, I've really, really progress uh, into my organization. You know, if they've come all the way to speak to you about joining your company and they have nothing to ask you about you or your, or your mission or your, you know, your product, or, then it doesn't really bode well for their level of enthusiasm um, for, your, uh, for your offer. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, you know, an interview is in fact a branding opportunity. Remember the person that's sitting across from you is probably from your industry and is probably quite well networked in your industry. And, you know, if they're asking questions about, you know, how you operate and what sort of culture you have, you, you really have an opportunity to impress upon them that uh, this is a great place to work and this is a great opportunity. And even if you reject them at the end of the day and you reject them properly, they will go out in the world and speak highly of your organization. 
Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a good opportunity to brand. Uh, there's another very good reason to look after candidates, even the ones you don't hire. I just talk about reference checks. Um, I did a, oh, hang on, there's a, another potential question. I'm just gonna jump in there. So if you always ask the same questions, what about risk candidates discovering questions in advance, gaining advantage and giving false impressions of the interview, right? Okay. Um, so, so look, first of all, uh, I, I, uh, I change, we change the questions for every single um, uh, assignment. So the chances of two candidates coming from exactly the same background, corresponding with each other and, uh, you know, sharing, um, uh, sharing notes, I think are pretty slim. And you probably know if, if that was going to happen. So I think that's a fairly uh, small, small risk. Uh, and also by using competency-based questions, um, you, you're really sort of getting, getting it around that uh, whole issue of people just reading a book and coming up with, you know, the best answer that they can find on the internet. If someone has to give an example that comes from their own personal experience, then uh, very hard for them to make that up uh, and sound genuine in, in that. I mean, you know, they really have to reach into their imagination and deliver it spontaneously. So unless you're dealing with a, a world-class improv actor, uh, it's pretty unlikely they're going to, they're going to sort of give too much of a false, um, uh, a false impression of themselves. So uh, I hope that answers that. Um, but uh, feel free to challenge that at a later stage if you want. Um, so reference checks. Now, um, I, you know, I, I uh, live in Spain and, and I've sort of come to understand that uh, in the Spanish environment, reference checking is not a very common procedure. And I, uh, I was a bit horrified when I discovered that um, because uh, to my mind, this is really one of the most crucial things. And I, back to that previous question about, you know, someone being great in an interview, um, you absolutely want to confirm everything you heard in that interview with a referee. You know, you want to go back and verify. And that's why the reference checking questions and the interview questions are, should be similar and they should both be derived from the job spec. Um, so uh, if you're not reference checking, you're really running a big risk of picking up someone who um, uh, is potentially going to be a problem in your business. Um, because like I say, with all the best will in the world, all the screening, all the best interviewing, you may still get people that are going to slip through the net and pull the wool over your eyes. Um, but reference checking is a really you know, good way of sort of verifying and going back and checking on that. And also puts candidates on notice. Candidates that can't give you referees is a, a, always an issue. Um, or if the reference is, is weak or hard to find, or if they give you too many referee details, that's all, these are all sort of uh, red flags for me. So hang on, let me see. Right, okay, so always reference check. That's rule number one. I'm um, never gonna deviate from that advice. Um, check issues that come up in the interview. So have your standard uh, reference checks, but if you spoke to someone and they were great on everything except you know, how they manage their time, for example, if uh, time management seemed to be an issue by their own, um, by their own admission, then check with their former manager uh, and say, you know, did this person have a problem with time management? It may not be a deal breaker, but it may give you some clues into how to manage them or how to upskill them to make them more effective in the role. Um, at the end of the reference, um, you know, just sort of ask this question, always ask it and try and ask it in as casual a way as possible. But, you know, oh, you know, that's great. There's, there's a great reference. But, you know, would you rehire them in the same role or would you rehire them tomorrow? And how the referee answers this question is, is really telling. And I, I say really keep your, um, your radar, uh, you know, finely tuned here. I mean, just listen to whether there's a pause, whether there's uh, uncertainty in the voice. Uh, but you'll find, I mean, I've See, seen this so many times people give a really nice reference and you know they're very happy to see this person move on because they like them they're a nice person they feel guilty about the fact that they had to leave the last role but when you confront the referee with the uh, question would you rehire them again you start getting uh, statements like well you know the company's moved on or you know they, they, they kind of you know they kind of have come to the end of the road at their time here these are slightly disturbing uh uh, slightly disturbing signs. Um, you, you really want to hear the person say, you know, spontaneously, yeah, we'd have them back in a second. And then, you, you know, you know you're talking about a top uh, quartile candidate. But if they're saying, well, you know, it's the time was up, you're looking 50th centile at best. Um, and you've then got to decide whether you're happy with a 50th centile candidate. Um, 
it's also a great way to find out how to manage someone. So if you're speaking to their previous manager, you can say, oh, you know, what, what's the best way to get the best out of them? And they can give you some very good advice on how this, you know, what this person's hot buttons are, uh, both in terms of motivation and demotivation, um, you know, what, what works best for them. Different people like to be managed differently. Um, you know, I just say throughout the whole process, Oh, I mean, one of my comments would be that always do reference checks verbally, never ask for written. It's just not worth the paper it's written on. Um, I mean, people will not give, give an honest response in writing if it's negative um, because uh, of the sort of risk of litigation, et cetera. Um, and they just don't want to commit to that. Um, but so when you're talking to someone and you hear a long pause or an evasive answer, uh, you know, just sort of dig a little deeper and, and ask yourself, why is that? What's going on here? Um, and I, this is another point, just remember this, references, referencing is a branding opportunity. When you're talking to a referee, you're probably speaking to someone quite senior in your industry because your candidate probably comes from your industry. And that person, you never know, might be your next uh, general manager when you grow, uh, or it might be an investor or someone that knows an investor. Um, uh, so, you know, make sure that you, by going through this rigorous process of doing a, a solid professional reference check, you're actually creating a positive uh, impression of your brand. Um, so don't forget that. It's easy to kind of compartmentalize recruitment as its own separate thing, but it's really part of your entire communication strategy. So let's talk about uh, negotiation. I see we've got 15 minutes. We're pretty close to the end. Um, how to negotiate. Uh, we talked about asking the question around what their salary expectations are. So just make sure that you've got that down pat before you come forward with, a, um, uh, with an offer. I'd say don't, don't deviate too far from what the candidate expected. I mean, if, if someone comes in and sits down in an interview and says, I'm looking for you know, twice what you're prepared to offer, that's, that's a conversation. You shouldn't even be getting to the negotiation stage without talking that through at the interview or subsequent to the interview. Uh, but I'd say you know, stick close to the, the, the money because I'm um, sorry, I've got Euro signs there. There may be people here using the pound sign. But um, um, they, uh, you know, no one wants to be offered way below what they're, uh, what they're worth. Um, or what they think they're worth. Um, I would you know, strongly recommend that you give a time limit for them to decide. Uh, so they've been through the process, they know, an, they know an offer's coming, you phone them up, make them an offer, you know, give them two days to decide, tell them you're gonna call them again in two days and ask for an answer. Because if, if you don't do this, then candidates who have other options that they're juggling will string you along for days and days and days and uh, may end up um, uh, not taking your job and by which time you, you've lost your second or third choice candidates um, who you may well end up hiring. But uh, if you leave those people hanging too long, every day that passes, their uh, impressions get soured. Um, so, you know, don't let people sort of drift along. And uh, if they're not making a decision, you really do. It's like any kind of sales process. You need to ask them, you know, what is the obstacle? What is stopping you from doing this? Um, you need to get that on the table because you can't count you can't counter it until you know what it is. Um, so yeah, I say, uh, you know, if you know, the, the longest you should give them is Friday to Monday, uh, but I would say two days. Um, beware the counter offer. So this may or may not be a concept that you're aware of, but uh, I'll explain it briefly. Um, you know, you get your perfect candidate, they come forward, you make them the offer, they say yes, they go away, they resign. Uh, and their last boss kind of breaks down and tells them that, you know, uh, how could you, how could they possibly leave them? And uh, they were just about to give you them a promotion or a pay rise. And suddenly your candidate that's already verbally accepted comes back, and says, I'm so sorry, but um, my current boss has, uh, you know, added another 10,000 to my salary. And um, uh, the problem with the counter offer, it can be quite hard to, to uh, get around, but it's not, a, it's not impossible. There are some arguments against it. Um, uh, one of the most um, profound arguments is, is, the, the statistic that's well known in, in our industry that, that most counter offers that are accepted, the person leaves within six months anyway, because, you know, it's, it's, I always ask people when they come for a job interview, why, why are you looking for a new job? And it's, it's very, very rarely that actually people, particularly in this industry, say, I'm looking for more money. Um, you know, it's always about career advancement, it's about opportunities, it's about opportunity to travel, uh, it's about unhappiness with their current work environment. Um, if they, um, uh, you know, if they turn around then and say, well, actually, I've taken more money in my current role, uh, you're, you're well within your rights to challenge them on, on why they came to you in the first place. You can say, well, you know, you, you told me that uh, you didn't like the culture and it was toxic. And, you know, wh why do you think that's going to change just because you've got a pay rise? 
Um, so, you know, that's one way to sort of counter offer it. Another way is to sort of um, uh, front, front load that question, which is when you're making the offer, say, look, you know, if your boss comes back and makes you a higher offer, what are you going to do? And get them to think it through before they get that nice surprise um, and, you know, discuss it up front. Um, in any negotiation, no matter what you're doing, always be prepared to walk away. Uh, you know, my uh, sort of mentor and recruitment over many years has always used the phrase hire, hire slow, fire fast. And once someone's in the door and on your payroll, um, you're committed to all those things I mentioned earlier, time, money, um, heartache if it's not working out. Uh, you know, if, if someone's taking a job, but they were, they were really borderline about whether, you know, they were getting paid enough, that's gonna come up as an issue later. Um, you know, the, the safer thing to do is not hire if, if you have any concerns or if the candidate has any concerns. Um, and uh, another, another rule in recruitment is always have a backup candidate. And, and for that reason, you, you always want to, you know, that's why it's useful to have a short list of uh, three to five people to interview. And um, you want this process to move quickly because, um, you know, you can't keep people hanging on for a couple of weeks, not wondering, you know, after an interview, wondering what's happened. Um, so yeah, always have a backup candidate um, if you can. So we'll just talk quickly about the concept of uh, rejection. I'm just going to look at a quick question. What about the rule of thumb that 25% have turned out to be the wrong person for the job? Uh, would I concur with this? Um, uh, look, uh, I mean, my point about this is the more rigorous and the more expert your recruitment process, the lower that figure will be. Um, and so I've not, I've not heard that particular rule of thumb. Um, but uh, the reality is if you go through, if you incorporate a proper recruitment process into your, uh, into your, uh, you know, the DNA of your company, then you should greatly reduce this, uh, this percentage. You can never get it down to zero, of course. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 25% is pretty high, I would think. Um, you know, there's something wrong with your process if, uh, if, uh, if that's the sort of rate of turnover. Uh, and I would also say that it wouldn't surprise me if that was the rate of turnover across all industries because recruitment is not done well. It's not given the, uh, the prominence that it really deserves uh, in terms of, I mean, you know, when you compare the amount of advice that people get on how to raise money, for example, uh, you know, it's, it's vastly greater than the amount of advice they get on recruitment. So, uh, uh, so that, that would be my answer to that question. Uh, so we'll just jump back to the, um, uh, we'll jump back to the uh, rejection point. So, um, this is a statement that, um, uh, you really want to avoid at all costs. Uh, there's, there's nothing worse than, um, than not getting back to a candidate one way or the other. You know, everyone deserves an answer. Everyone that entered the process deserves an answer. Even if it's a quick thanks, but no thanks, um, uh, everyone should get something. And, and that's one of the reasons why recruitment software is really good because it'll have some, you can build some hard stops into your processes that prevent, uh, that prevent this from, from uh, slipping through the, the cracks. Um, so I've made that point, uh, use recruitment software. I would say as soon as you know someone's not in the process, uh, reject as soon as you know. I mean, just don't keep them hanging on any longer than necessary and they will absolutely appreciate it. Um, and, you know, uh, be respectful and compassionate. Like I say, if you're, you know, you interview 50 people, you, you have 50 applicants and you reject 49 of them. That's a lot of people who might go away and say nice things about you or may go away and say terrible things about you. And the, and the, the worst things they'll say about you is they were so unprofessional and they never got back to me. Um, so don't let that happen. Um, I would, as a rule of thumb, if anyone comes in and has an interview, I reject them by phone. I don't just send them an email saying, thanks for coming in, but no thanks. It just leaves a sour taste in the mouth and it takes five minutes to phone someone up and let them down. Um, if you have any, give advice, feedback, uh, or referrals, if you can, um, you know, people are really appreciative of that, uh, particularly feedback. People are always wanting feedback. So, you know, uh, try and have some of you, if you, if you can. And, and I, I'd say this, this may sound uh, contradictory, but rejection is absolutely a branding opportunity. I had someone come up to me at a conference the other day and say, hey, you rejected me from a job the other day when, uh, you know, when I was working for another organization. And I had a sort of a moment, moment's panic, but then they said, you know, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the process and I was really grateful for you phoning me and telling me that I didn't get the job. And, and you know, I think it was a fantastic experience. So they didn't get the job, but they came away feeling really positive about the process they went through and that really is it speaks volumes about your organization if you if you put that kind of message out to the world so i'll go through this fairly quickly none of you i mean i i would suggest that 
most of you, uh, I don't know the, mix, the exact mix of your organizations, but uh, most of you are a long way from using a search firm. Uh, and, and I, you know, my, my sort of tagline for this, uh, this um, uh, training is, uh, you know, uh, startup founders uh, can and should do their own recruitment because you need to learn how to recruit. Um, and that means that when you come to using a search firm, you're, you know, cognizant of the processes. It makes you much, much less vulnerable to, um, uh, you know, to entering a, a bad deal or, or uh, you know, having, having recruiters, uh, you know, uh, cut corners on you. Uh, you know exactly what you're looking for. And you're also making a positive strategic decision. It's not a sort of a, a disastrous, uh, uh, you know, last port of call. Um, you know, it's not a sort of a panic reaction. Um, but, you know, when should you use a, a search firm? So, uh, certainly when it's not a good use of your time, this is the same thing. If you're finding recruitment is taking up a lot of time, then outsource it. And, uh, you know, uh, people really underestimate how expensive recruitment can be. And uh, they think, well, you know, recruitment agencies seem expensive, but, uh, you know, look at exactly how much time you're wasting. And then ask yourself, are we getting the best candidates using our own internal systems? Um, and that, there's a bunch of reasons when, uh, it might not be best for you to sort of start de novo with the search, um, particularly for, for rare skills, for example, or if you're looking beyond your own networks or further afield, um, recruiters will inevitably have, have greater reach. So when you need hard, hard to find skills, when you need to grow fast, so typically after a series A or a series B, companies often double in size and, uh, uh, you know, quite a lot of our clients are sort of at that stage. They've done all their own recruitment up until then, but suddenly they need to hire seven people at once. And uh, just imagine, you know, how much of your time that's going to take up uh, when you should be focusing on, uh, you know, business development or, or pushing forward the clinical trials or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I'd say this, you know, recruiters, you know, look at the cost and, and, and work it out, you know, be dispassionate about it, put it on a spreadsheet and work out, you know, if the, if the price that you were proposed to be charged uh, is, uh, is good value for money or bad value for money. Um, you know, so but, but be honest about what it's actually going to cost you in terms of time and effort. And so this is, uh, I'll rush through this because we're very close to the end, but uh, what a good recruiter will do for you, um, uncover it passive candidates. So this is a really critical factor. And some of the best candidates are not actually looking at advertising. Uh, and a good recruiter should be doing search, which is actually reaching out to people who are just sitting happily in their desk uh, and tap them on the shoulder. Uh, they can target your competitors or specific candidates that you want to target, but for, for some, for whatever reason, it's uh, not appropriate for you to contact them directly. They can look well beyond your own networks. There's obviously a natural habit of uh, sticking to networks you know. Um, they can help manage that salary negotiation, which can be really helpful if it's, uh, it's kind of stuck at a certain point. Um, and they can really save you time for your core, core business. And, uh, and I sort of make this final point. When you're looking at a recruiter in front of you and negotiating with them, do imagine them, you know, just think of them. This person is going to be the front, you know, the face of my employment brand when they're out there talking to people about my company. So make sure you're hiring someone that you're completely comfortable with and make sure you brief them properly on exactly what your, your culture is and what you're looking for so that they're represented accurately. So that's, uh, that's the speech. Uh, my name is John Bethel. As um, Ala mentioned earlier on, I'm an EIT health mentor and uh, uh, in the mentor from the coaching network. Um, you know, if any of you, I know you guys have, uh, some of you get um, some funds to, to allocate to that. If, uh, if you want some assistance, more in-depth assistance with your recruitment strategy, that's obviously something that uh, we can help you with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you.